always tells the story of a girl who's penis! <laughs> What's up guys, it's David, and today I'm going to be ranking the discography of The Velvet Underground from worst to best. The Velvet Underground are my favorite band of all time, so all four of their records are in my top 40, top 30 favorite albums of all time, so even the album I'm going to rank last is pretty much near perfect to me. And yes, I said four albums because Squeeze is not a Velvet Underground album, I don't care what anybody says that when that album was released, none of the original members were still part of the group, that is a Doug Ewell album, not a Velvet Underground album. It does not count. As many people have already pointed out, it's just a Velvet Underground record in name. It's not actually a Velvet Underground record. There's no Mo Tucker, no Sterling Morrison, no John Cale, and most importantly, Lou Reed. So you know what that means? It's not a Velvet Underground record. But if you want to be stubborn about it and count it, obviously I would rank it last. But anyways, let's get into the actual Velvet Underground records now. At number four, I have the group's final record, Loaded, which to this day stands as the perfect example of how to make an album that is commercial without sacrificing your artistic sensibilities or dumbing it down. This record was an attempt to get a radio single. The label went to the band and told them that they wanted a record loaded with hits, hence the title Loaded. And they succeeded in doing that. All ten tracks on the album are very catchy and instantly memorable. This attempt at a more radio-friendly sound definitely makes this record stand out within the Velvet's discography. It's a lot more upbeat and energetic than their third record, but it's a lot less experimental and it's much more straightforward than their debut and sophomore records. The songwriting on this record is just as good as it is on any of their other albums. There's Rock and Roll, which tells the story of a girl whose dull life was saved by discovering rock music. New Age is a beautiful song about getting over the past and moving on with your life. And the epic closer, Oh Sweet Nothing, is about how when you're out on your own and you have not a dollar to your name, you have absolutely nothing. How that's really a beautiful thing because you have a second chance at life. You have an opportunity to start from scratch. At number three, I have the group's self-titled 1969 record. Uh, that's not the real cover because I got it in this box set here, but you can probably see the real cover there on the back. I hope you can. No, I don't have this record on vinyl. I have one record shop in my town, so whatever they carry, that's what I'm able to buy. I've never seen them carrying this any time that I've been there, but as soon as I do, I'll buy it. This record was a huge change of pace from their first two albums, especially coming right off of White Light, White Heat. This is definitely the group's most subtle record. This was the group's first record without John Cale, who had been replaced by Doug Ewell, which I'm sure had a lot to do with this change in sound. On this record, they traded in the fiery, screeching sound of their last record for a much warmer and prettier sound. Songs like Candy Says and I'm Set Free and Jesus and Pale Blue Eyes are amongst the most lovely songs that the Velvets have ever written. I love the three-song stretch of Jesus beginning to see the light and I'm set free on the first part where he's crying out for help from Jesus to help him find his proper place. I'm beginning to see the light where he's finally beginning to emerge from his troubles and see a brighter future for himself. And on I'm set free, where finally his newfound faith has set him free from his troubled past. What Goes On is one of the group's grooviest and catchiest tracks. I love the organ on that song. I mentioned that this is the group's most subtle record, and that's true for the most part, except for one glaring exception, which is the song The Murder Mystery, which is probably actually their most experimental and abstract song that they've ever recorded. It's also a very perplexing song. I remember the first few times I listened to this record, I could not make heads or tails of it, but over time, I've definitely come to love this track. The thing about this song is that Lou Reed himself has said that this was a failed experiment, and I agree with him. So how is it a good song, then, you might be wondering? Well, the thing that they failed on is they tried to make it so that there was one voice talking out of one speaker and another voice talking out of the other speaker, and that fails because they kind of clash with each other and you can't tell what's being said. It's like trying to have two conversations at the same time. But the reason that I still think that this is a good song is because even though you can't make out what the voices are saying, the effect that this trick has musically on the song, I think it really pays off. Both voices are doing this weird spoken word type of thing, but in different rhythms, which to me gives the track a really cool vibe, especially since it's over a fantastic instrumental with these really tense guitars and some pummeling drums. And actually, the two voices thing does work on the chorus, because on the chorus, it's much more of a back and forth, so you can actually hear what's being said both at the same time, and I thought in that case, it was much more successful. And I also love that eerily happy piano line that kicks in around the end of the song. This is a track that I'm sure a lot of people hate, but I'm also sure that a lot of people love it like I do. 
Going from their most subtle album to their craziest, at number two, I have White Light, White Heat. The Velvet Underground are known in general for just being one of the most influential bands of all time, but I think this record might be their most influential. I've seen some people argue that it's the first punk record ever recorded, and I definitely see where they're coming from, and even if that's not true, I think it can definitely be said that this was a major influence when it came to the start of punk music in the 70s. This record is absolutely chaotic. While there are moments on it that feel more meticulous, there's also plenty of moments on this where there feels like there's no method to the Velvet Underground's madness, which to me is what makes this record so great. The term raw, I feel, is way overused, even by myself when it comes to describing music, but this record, this is the definition of raw. The lo-fi recording quality, John Cale's screeching viola, and moments where the instruments seem to be misplayed on purpose just lead to an incredibly raw, gritty, and just unique sound. And speaking of crazy, the last song on this record, Sister Ray, is maybe the most insane thing I've ever heard in my entire life, and it's also one of the greatest. This is a 17 and a half minute song, one of the best closers to an album ever, and it is just pure, unadulterated madness. Lou Reed's lyrics on the song tell a bonkers story about a heroin-fueled orgy where somebody ends up getting shot, but since everyone in the room is just so fucked up, all they have to say about it is that they hope no blood gets on the carpet. You know, they don't seem to actually care that somebody has just been shot. Pair that with one of the most psychotic instrumentals ever recorded, and you have an absolutely unforgettable song. The thing about this track is that the group decided to record it in one take. They decided to leave in any mistakes they were bound to make. They were doing a ton of improvisation, making it sound, like I mentioned earlier, completely raw. Lou Reed and Sterling Morrison were on the guitars, Mo Tucker was playing her drums, and John Cale plugged his organ into a distorted guitar amplifier, which just sounds plain awesome when you hear it in the track. And they just went for 17 and a half minutes, like I said, leaving in all mistakes. I, I find it hilarious, the story about how the guy, the engineer who was in for this session, he just walked out of the studio halfway through because he didn't want to have to listen to this anymore. Well, I mean, too bad for that guy because he missed out on the recording of one of the best songs in music history, you know, in my opinion. But now on to what I think is the group's best record and what is one of my two favorite albums of all time, and that is their debut album, The Velvet Underground and Nico. One of my favorite quotes from any musician is what Brian Eno said about this album. This thing was way too experimental and avant-garde back in the day to get any type of radio play or have any type of commercial success, so it only sold 30,000 copies originally. And what Brian Eno said is that even though it only sold 30,000 copies, each one of those 30,000 people started their own band. And that just speaks to the fact that the Velvet Underground are seriously are one of the most influential groups in history and this was an extremely boundary-pushing album back when it first came out. This album is experimental rock at its finest, and 50 years later, it still sounds like nothing that I've ever heard. A lot of that can probably be attributed to John Cale's viola, which on a lot of these songs is screeching and wailing to the point where it shouldn't sound good, but the way that the Velvets use it and incorporate it into these songs, it works so perfectly. Take the song Heroin, for example, which is an ode to the drug and describes the sensation of doing it and lose relationships with the drug. Each verse on the song starts really slow and quiet, but builds in tempo and volume as the verse progresses. This is done to simulate the sensation of actually doing heroin. And then the last verse, when John Cale's screeching, wailing viola is also a part of this buildup, to me it perfectly captures the madness and pain that also comes with doing the drug. Speaking of that song, that also brings me to another major reason I love this record, and that is the songwriting and just the content. Back when this album first came out, you did not hear musicians talking about the things that the Velvet Underground are talking about on this record. Like I just mentioned, they're talking about drug use, they're talking about buying drugs from dealers, there's talk about prostitution, BDSM. I mean, the content on this thing is vulgar, it's explicit, but it's also done extremely well. Lou Reed, honestly, is one of the best songwriters of all time. This album also features the singer Nico on lead vocals for three of the songs, Femme Fatale, All Tomorrow's Parties, and I'll Be Your Mirror. She is an extremely welcome presence on all of these tracks. Her voice captures feelings on these songs that maybe Lou Reed's voice couldn't, and they also also make for some of the prettier moments on the record, because while a lot of this album does sound really gritty and lo-fi, there are definitely moments where it does sound very beautiful, like I just mentioned with those Nico songs, and on the intro song, Sunday Morning, which just like I already mentioned earlier with Pale Blue Eyes, this is another one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. With those twinkling piano keys, John Cale's viola actually sounding lovely, and with Lou Reed giving a vocal performance, 
that is almost unrecognizable. I also love how this album ends with the song European Sun and that five or six minute insane medley of clashing and screeching guitars. It perfectly closes out this album and was a sign of where the group would go next on White Light, White Heat. Like I said, this is one of my two favorite albums of all time, and I think that it is a perfect record, but just overall, all four of the Velvet Underground's albums are incredible. I mean, there's a reason that I think that they're the best band of all time. I mean, they certainly are my personal favorite band of all time. And it saddens me that to this day, that these guys are still criminally underrated. They've certainly had a lot more respect and success, you know, since they first came out in retrospect. But, you know, most people you ask today probably still don't know who the Velvet Underground are. And maybe even if they've heard of them, they probably haven't even heard of the Velvet Underground song. So, you know, I think that these guys deserve to be the most famous band of all time. I mean, they certainly are one of, if not the most influential band of all time. So if you haven't heard of these guys, or if you haven't heard any of their music, do yourself a favor and go back and listen to it because it is some of the most incredible music ever recorded. But yeah, that's my ranking of the Velvet Underground's discography from worst to best. Leave your rankings down in the comment section below because this is one of those cases where all the records are so good that I'm sure everyone has a different ranking. And thank you guys as always for watching and I'll see you next time.